Welcome to all who are here and those who will join us on YouTube later. To begin, I'd like to highlight some of the announcements. You might turn to your bulletin if you have it. I encourage you to watch the children's story recording that Jake recorded earlier and join the Zoom meeting on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And if you have joys or concerns to share during the week, be sure to let Mary know in the church office. Please read your bulletin and check your email for information about our congregational meeting on February 7th, about the book study that will be beginning on Saturday, February 13th, focusing on the book Soul Force, Seven Pivots Toward Courage, Community, and Change, and also the spiritual emphasis time with Neil and Janie Blau that will be on February 14th. Be sure to send your contributions by mail or drop them off at the church office. And also check out your bulletin for other, other information that you might need to see. During the time between Christmas and Lent, we celebrate the season of Epiphany, focusing on the revelation or unveiling of Christ. Our theme here at Hively is Jesus, Man of Mystery. What is mysterious about Jesus? What is being revealed? What do we need to see through new eyes? And how can the light of God's good news break into our gloomy nights, gloomy lives? Perhaps if we come to the reading of the familiar passages with a beginner's mind, imagining ourselves as one of the disciples, or as one of the outside observers, we will discover something new that speaks to us even today. Please join me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. I will read the light print and invite you to join me on the dark print as you stay muted. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, our lives are shrouded in the darkness of a pandemic, political turmoil, losses of life, health, financial security, and so much more. We need your light to shine in our hearts and lives, to show us the way through the perils we face, and to give us hope. Open our eyes to see the light of your love piercing the darkness. Invite Ed to come forward and lead us in Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Is Sing the Story One or print it on your insert. Thank you. 
And Margaret Swatsky will bring us our children's, or our, not children, our peace candle lighting. Every week at Hively, we light the peace candle as a reminder of who we are and who God is. And today I'd like to read a short story before we light the candle. It's called Visit with God, written by Jane Huber Pfeiffer, and it comes from Seasoned with Peace. A Visit with God. As he, Jesus, came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. From Luke 19. I knocked on the door. It swung open, and there was God. Come in, come in. I'm so glad you came. I was waiting for you. The teapot is hot and the muffins are still warm. I followed into a warm, cozy sitting room with two soft chairs. Sit down. I'll be right back. I sank into the chair. God came back carrying a tray. The small table between us held our mugs and muffins. And after some small talk, God looked into my eyes and asked, How are you? Burdened, I said. About what? Stuff, big stuff, like the shape of our world stuff. What do you see? God asked. Some of us are filthy rich, others of us are deathly poor, and those in the middle are always complaining. Things like that, and war, and earthquakes, and greed, and we need help, God, I said. What would you like me to do, God asked. Well, for starters, spread out the resources better. Stop all the floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, and cyclones. Clean up the air and the rivers. Eradicate diseases. Take care of the children. And stop the wars. Stop the killing. Please make it all stop. There was a long silence. Do you have children? God asked. Yes. Did you ever make them do something they didn't want to do? Yes. Did it work? No. It doesn't work for me either, God sighed. Another silence. So what does work? I asked. Love. Tears roll down God's face, and love hurts, I know. Lord God, almighty lover of the universe, 
Shape us by your love and grant us the grace to surrender to the way of love so that your dream and our dream for this world might be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus, whose way was and is love. Amen. And now please join me in lighting the peace candle. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. This short little song, number 37 in Sing the Story or in your insert in the bulletin, contains lots of images for Jesus. We'll sing it through twice. Our scripture reading for today is from Mark 1, verses 21 to 28. I will be reading in English, and Jake will follow in Spanish. The man with an unclean spirit. They, his disciples and Jesus, went up to, to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Del Evangelio de San Marcos, en versículo a ver, 21 a 28 del primer capítulo. Jesús expulsa a un espíritu maligno. Entraron en Capernaum. Y tan pronto como llegó el sábado, Jesús fue a la sinagoga y se puso a enseñar. La gente se asombraba de su enseñanza, porque la impartía como quien tiene autoridad y no como los maestros de la ley. De repente, en la sinagoga, un hombre que estaba poseído por un espíritu maligno gritó, ¿Por qué te entrometes, Jesús de Nazaret? ¿Has venido a destruirnos? Yo sé quién eres tú, el santo de Dios. Cállate, lo respondió Jesús. Sal de ese hombre. 
Entonces el espíritu maligno sacudió al hombre violentamente y salió de él dando un alarido. Todos se quedaron tan asustados que se preguntaban unos a otros, ¿qué es esto? ¿Una enseñanza nueva? Pues lo hace con autoridad. Les da órdenes incluso a los espíritus malignos y le obedecen. Como resultado, su fama se extendió rápidamente por toda la región de Galilea. La palabra de Dios, gracias a Dios. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you, O oh Lord, are our strength and redeemer. Amen. Keeping secrets is hard work. Living as I do with two young children, I get a front row perspective of how hard it can be to keep a secret that's exciting or tantalizing or just plain mind-blowing. Children are no different from the rest of us in their love of secrets and the excitement of sharing them, but they sometimes lack a little bit of discernment about the appropriate, the appropriate audience to which to divulge a secret. As parent to a very conversational three-year-old, I've learned the hard way that children sharing secrets can be pretty mortifying at times. Several months ago, right after I shared with my daughters, Debbie and Gabby, that they could expect a new baby in the spring, Debbie took to sharing the whole, this news with the whole world many weeks before I was ready to do so myself. Whether we were in the grocery store, the park, the preschool pickup line, or at church, for a while, Debbie was bound and determined to share the news with everybody that mommy has a baby in her tummy and she's getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single day. The ironic problem that Jesus has in our reading from Mark's gospel is that he is not keen on making his full identity known to the public. But the acts of power and compassion the teachings of wisdom and grace that Jesus demonstrates through his ministry are just too much for people to keep a secret. The tension between the proclamations of Jesus's power on one hand and Jesus's repeated attempts to squelch these proclamations are such an important part of Mark's gospel that scholars have named this phenomenon the messianic secret. The messianic secret just keeps showing up throughout Mark. It comes up in four healing stories where following a proclamation of Jesus' identity, Jesus tries to prohibit the sharing of this news. It comes up after Peter's confession where he correctly and, and boldly proclaims, you are the Messiah, and Jesus is stern in his command not to spread this knowledge. It comes up after the transfiguration of Jesus when Jesus' fully divine nature bathes him in this radiant glory of God. And when all else fails, when people fail to keep Jesus' secret for him, Jesus tries to hide himself from the crowds, a retreat with which I think every leader, introvert in leadership can probably identify. The idea seems to be that during the time of Jesus' ministry, only a certain inner circle was supposed to know exactly who Jesus was. After the resurrection, Jesus' plan was for the circle to widen and that the full messianic nature of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection could become known to the whole world. Now, especially in our era of hyper access to all kinds of information, where you can pull out your phone and get up to the minute news and with celebrities and politicians tweeting their latest promotions, Jesus' secrecy might be a little hard for us to understand. What did Jesus hope to gain by delaying the proclamation of his message to the world? Why does Mark choose to tell us the story of Jesus' ministry in this very peculiar way? 
According to some biblical scholars, the messianic secret was a way to explain the fact that the historical Jesus wasn't really invested in making claims about his own messianic status. The Jesus that Mark knew didn't have a lot to say about himself. This taciturn approach to his own identity contrasted with the proclamation of the churches that Mark was witnessing, where Jesus was already being proclaimed as the Messiah. So to explain this disconnect between the words of Jesus himself on one hand and the proclamation of the church on the other, Mark crafted this teaching of the messianic secret that it was by Jesus' own will that the community of believers would only celebrate Jesus' full identity after his death and resurrection. Well, this historical explanation is definitely one possibility, but there are other ones too. For example, all the press, all the publicity could limit Jesus' mobility as he went about doing ministry. Jesus was on a mission, and when the Galilean paparazzi dogged his steps too much, it interfered with the real work he had to do. At times when Jesus' works of power got a lot of attention, Jesus lost some of his freedom. He was pressed by the crowd and needed to find refuge in quiet places. He was nearly arrested before the proper time came. Perhaps part of Jesus' insistence on secrecy could be that he was keen on carrying out the mission that he had in the time that he had in the manner that was best suited to his identity and vocation. Now we could keep going and we could brainstorm other reasons for this messianic secret. But I think that the secret is only half and perhaps the lesser half of the story that Mark is trying to tell us. For Mark and for other writers of the New Testament, what we proclaim with our lips is never sufficient to capture what God is doing in the world anyway. The movement of God behind the scenes of in our world in the life of Jesus will come to light regardless of whether we choose to proclaim it or not. So maybe biblical scholars have spilled too much ink on this messianic secret and we've spent too much time talking about this secret and not nearly enough time talking about the powerful revelation of God that Mark and the rest of the Bible illuminate. Because whenever there's a secret to be kept in Mark, it finds its match in Revelation. This one-to-one correspondence between secret and revelation is something that Jesus himself recognizes in Mark 4.22 when he says, For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed nor is anything secret except to come to light. In other words, secrets can last for a time, but at the end of the day, at the end of our times, God's power revealed in Jesus Christ will make itself known whether we like it or not. Whether we open our mouths in praise or solemnly clamp our jaws shut, the good news that Jesus came to heal and befriend and save is so good that it will find a way to the press one way or another. So in Luke, when the leaders instruct Jesus to silence the people who exalt him upon his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus' retort to the leaders is simply, I tell you, if these were to be silent, the stones would shout out. The earth itself recognizes the lordship of Christ and his coming. And then in Matthew's scene of Jesus' triumphal entry, when the children of the city sing, Hosanna to the son of David, The leaders are angry as well, and Jesus replies with a quote of Psalm 8-2. Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praises for yourself. And that's a similar concept to Isaiah's beautiful word picture, that you will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst forth before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The idea that's held in common between all these verses is that even if we keep silent, creation itself cannot restrain the praises of our good God from bursting out of its seams. It's like what the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins writes when he says, The whole earth is charged with the grandeur of God. 
The news of the God who made each of us and who fills this earth and who pitched a tent with us in the flesh of Jesus Christ simply cannot be contained, secret or no secret. So in our passage from Mark today, the irony is that this impure spirit is only second to God in correctly identifying the true nature of Jesus Christ. In Mark 1, we're just beginning to see the story of Jesus unfold. And our scene with the spirit at Capernaum closely follows Jesus' baptism, wherein as Jesus emerges from the water, the spirit of God descends as a dove, and a heavenly voice proclaims, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. You'd think that after this heavenly recognition of Jesus' sonship, the next voice to identify Jesus' unique and holy identity would at least be a decent and respectable person. But no, in our passage, it's an unclean spirit possessing a man who gets the silver medal for proclaiming Jesus' divinity. It's to this unwelcome spirit that Jesus gives the stern reproof, be quiet just as he will hush other early proclaimers of the gospel message. Met with Jesus' next pithy command, come out of him, the spirit has no choice but to leave the beleaguered man in peace. So like it or not, that impure spirit has left its mark. It's through the spirit's proclamation, ironically, that the news of Jesus' power and presence begins to spread throughout the land. The Galilean social butterflies, just like the Elkhart ones, begin to spread the news that Jesus' power reaches even demonic forces, saying to one another, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He gives orders even to unclean spirits, and they obey him. Contrary to Jesus' own hopes that the message of his ministry could stay hidden a little longer, the message of the gospel spreads through even the most unlikely preachers. The uncomfortable truth is that we can have all the right words to proclaim, and our hearts and lives can still fail to embody the gospel message. If even an impure spirit can know the right confession about Jesus, but spend its time tormenting a man's soul, Mark suggests that we shouldn't get too comfortable with ourselves if we have the right creeds and catechisms about Jesus' identity. The epistle of James sarcastically chides an audience of believers content to stay in the the realm of right words, that their lives bear no witness to the gospel. In step with our story of the impure spirit today, James writes in 2.19, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Verbal confession is not enough. And indeed, it can let us hide behind the pretense that we have grasped the wholeness of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. That realization that the right words are not enough, that they cannot contain the marvelous truth of what God has done in Jesus, is a challenging one for some of us. It's a challenging one for me. I'm a teacher and writer by profession, and words are kind of my thing. And yet, through this hushing of proclamation and mark, Jesus reminds us that our words about the gospel are not ultimate. They can never fully sum up who God is and what God has done for us. The fuller revelation of God emerges through the incarnational presence of Jesus among us. This revelation comes in the acts of power and mercy that Jesus performs without an ounce of proper recognition as he works among us in the world. And we, the church, can embody this revelation as we do the work that God has put before us in our community. Our fullest proclamation is never the sermons we preach or the creeds we recite, but the ways that we stand with the powerless, walk with the hurting, and speak peace to the broken. The full proclamation of the gospel lies not in our words, but in the work of Christ that takes on flesh among us. As St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. 
I've experienced Hively preaching the gospel this way over the past several weeks as a large and well-coordinated team of this church family pulled off moving Debbie and Gabby and me to our new home. Some people packed boxes and boxes and boxes. Some people cleaned my old home. Some people laid shelf paper at my new home. Some people carried boxes and furniture. Some people bought and installed appliances. Some people served dinner. Some people simply assured me that it would all be all right. And I don't think in all that hubbub that anyone cracked open a Bible, said a prayer out loud, or preached the good news explicitly. To an outsider looking in, you might say that the true identity of Jesus, the true reason for the familial way that you all cared for me, was a secret. And yet I knew with the proclamation that shone through each member of the Hively family who was present in body or spirit was. I knew that the acts of kindness, down to the most seemingly mundane, revealed the grandeur of God. I knew that the hands that carried my stuff to Wolf Avenue were the nail-pierced ones of Christ. I knew that the boots that tracked in snow and mud as the boxes brought in were the beautiful feet upon the mountains that bring good news. I knew that this was the church that was gathered. And without an explicit word being said, I knew that this was the incarnational love of God's unconditional grace, which you have offered to me so freely without a question of the backstory and without me doing anything to earn it. That is preaching the gospel without words. And it's these acts of the church that show a love so beyond itself that remind us that the good news we proclaim is a truth that goes beyond anything we could ever say. It's not a secret that originates with us, nor is it a secret that will be buried with us. It's a message, a logos, a living word that originates with God and belongs only and wholly to God. Whether or not our lips give praise to this message, whether or not we are silent or proclaim this truth from the rooftops, Mark leads us to trust that this word of hope will find a way into this world. Mark's Jesus of secrecy has less interest in preaching sermons about himself than in going and being light in the darkness around him, feeding, healing, and loving. And so whether demons spout the truth with shuddering tongues, whether lepers and prostitutes and the rejected are those who properly acknowledge it, whether little children and babies, the trees and the stones and the hills shout it out, whether we ourselves with our faltering and awkward words find the courage to give it voice, the truth of Jesus Christ will find its way into our hearts and into this hurting world. Amen. Our next hymn, which is number 630 in the hymnal or printed in your bulletin, is one we don't sing very often, and we probably won't sing it anymore because I noticed it didn't make it into the new hymnal. But it's based on the current the text that we read uh, and um, has a very interesting accompaniment that, that goes with it uh, and sort of captures the sense of the spirit that, that is in the song. And a reminder that we need to be whole ourselves to do the kinds of things that Susanna challenged us to. So I invite you to join in. Silence and eat on clean spirit, cry God's healing holy one, cease your ranting flesh can bear it, free as night before the sun, at Christ's voice the demon trembled from its face.
Let us pray. God who came in the flesh, who was revealed even by the forces of evil in this world who could not keep their tongues silent. We know, God, that your glory and your goodness and your love will go forth um, despite who's proclaiming or not proclaiming your goodness, God, because it is built into all of us and built into your entire creation. So we thank you, God, for Jesus who embodied your love in flesh and blood, Jesus who healed, Jesus who lived, Jesus who died and rose again, conquering the throes of death and destruction, and in whose life we now live our lives. May your goodness be lived out, if not in the words that we speak every day, God, then as Susanna is encouraged in our actions, in the lives that we live, may they spell out the gift of your love in this world for people who are yearning and hungering for love and hope and meaning. May our lives give that hope. And may you speak to us when we do not feel that hope in our own lives. Thank you, God, for who you are, for this secret that couldn't remain a secret and that now is proclaimed throughout the whole world and even in the cosmos beyond, God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may you go in peace, and may you go in the one who spoke both secretly and outwardly, who spoke to our inner hearts and to the world around us, life and love and healing and grace. May that same life and love and healing and grace be spoken through you, both in word and deed, but when the words lack, at least in deed. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>